John 1 talks about how the, the purpose of Jesus is that, that he would dwell with us, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, mm -hmm. uh, that God's entire purpose is that heaven and earth would come into relationship again. And it's really funny that that word that's used where it says that, that Jesus dwelled among us, the word in Greek is the same word that's used for tabernacle. Mm -hmm. The tabernacle was a place where God's presence would rest. So he, quite literally, he's saying, you know, that, that the word became flesh and he tabernacled among us. Well, hello and welcome back to the Calvary Assembly podcast. This is our second episode and we are so glad that you are joining us and tuning in. This is really a space where we have dialogue around tough questions and tensions in scripture. And today is our Christmas episode. And I am your host, Jonathan Sigmund. I am joined by two of our pastors, Pastor Bob Reeves and Stephen Nichols. Thank you guys for joining. How are we doing today? We're doing good. Good. Excited for Christmas. Good. Merry Christmas Merry to you. Yes. Christmas. You know? Lot to be joyful about this season. <laughs> That's right. And, but uh, the way you're saying it makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we're off to a great start. Um, so yeah, what I would I would love to have a conversation with you guys around the Christmas story and tensions that that arise when when you read this. And it's not a large portion of scripture, but it's such a vital and important part in scripture that I want to dive in today. So uh, let's jump into our first question, which is, do you believe that Jesus thought that he was God? And, or do you think that this is like something that Christians made up later in time? Like maybe they were reading the Hebrew scriptures and then they kind of made that up. Uh, tell me about your interpretation of that. Yeah. So, which is, that's really interesting because I, I never knew this actually until very recently, but there's a lot of people who say, well, Jesus not only wasn't God, uh, but he never actually claimed to be God. And at the very least, he never even thought that he was God. Like it wasn't even a thing that uh, has gone through his mind, which uh, would rattle somebody like me who's grown up kind of in a Christian home and has always kind of believed that. Um, so so why do we actually think that Jesus is God? And we're going to talk about like, why is that so important? I believe, uh, of course, and I think we're all in agreement here that, that Jesus not only was God, but he actually believed that he was God and he would claim to be God over and over again, and not just any God, random God, but the God of Israel or Yahweh, as they would call him, um, that this this is the same God that and Jesus claimed to be that. And he would do this in very provocative ways that and I think actually led him to get killed. There's one story in particular uh, in Mark chapter two, where uh, a bunch of people bring a paralyzed man to Jesus. And before Jesus heals this paralyzed man, um, he says, hey, you know, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees around him freak out and they're like, you can't do that. Like, who, who can forgive sins but God alone? Only God can forgive sins. They're very clear as to what Jesus is, is claiming here, that, that he is God. He has the ability to take away sins. Nobody else could do that. And the Jewish thinking, nobody else could do that except for God himself. And so Jesus is saying, hey, your, your sins are forgiven. He knows what he's saying here and he knows who he's talking to. He knows what, what they're going to pick up when he says that. Uh, and they were not happy about the claim that he was making. But Jesus was very clear as to who he was and where he stood. And then even there's one passage where he, he's talking to the Pharisees again. And he says, you know what, before Abraham was, I am. And that word I am, it, it's the same phrase that God used when he spoke to Moses and others. When Moses like, hey, who, who should I say sent me when he went into Egypt? And God says, tell him that I am sent you. And Jesus knows what he's doing here, and they killed him for it. He, Jesus is very clear as to who he believed he was, uh, and that's a very big deal. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, when when the disciples wanted Jesus to show them God, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen God, you've seen the Father. So he wasn't ambiguous at all about who he claimed to be, and it is why people uh, wanted him crucified. All right, so what do you guys think about how the Bible makes some outlandish claims? I'm thinking specifically about the virgin birth and, uh, you know, do you guys believe in this and what, what kind of substance is, is available for this? Pastor Bob, I'll start with you. Yeah. I, well, so it's a hard thing to believe, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think a couple of things, if, if we are going to believe that God can create humans to begin with, then this form of creating another human doesn't seem outlandish to me. Um, 
humans themselves are capable of in vitro fertilization and embryo transplants and and uh, all of this is a way to bypass a pers the normal process for human procreation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we should seriously question anytime we think God can do less than we can do. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I do think that um, there's, there needs to be something special about the birth of Jesus. Otherwise, he's just a human who tried really hard and did better than anybody else, and he achieved salvation. But what Scripture tells us is not that Jesus was a human who achieved salvation. He was God who brought salvation to us as a human. That's a very different way to think about it. So one of the um, um, Christmas story accounts of the birth of Jesus and the virgin birth, birth is found in Luke. And Luke is a very interesting book because um, Luke is, he's not just writing just for the fun of it. He says that in the very first chapter, first couple of verses, he's writing an account of the story of Jesus to a, a guy, uh, his friend, whose name is the uh, Theopolis, I believe is how he pronounced his name. Uh, so and he's, he's writing account and he says in the very beginning that he's gone through great lengths uh, to record all of this information so he could give it to him and, and to other people. And throughout the book of Luke, there's actually a couple different times where uh, Luke is telling a story about what Mary, what happened to Mary. And it says very specifically that Mary treasured these things in her heart. Mm -hmm. And the question at least that raises up, well, how does he know that Mary treasured these things in his heart, in her heart? And it's because he talked to Mary and he, he talked and went and found all this out that he was like this historian and researcher, if you will, he's not just writing these things from decades and decades later. He went and talked to the eyewitnesses of all of these stories and got their account collected into, together, compared them, and then put them into one account. And, and we call that account Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Um, so these stories are, are miraculous and wonderful, but they're not just crazy fantasies uh, that they have been collected together from the eyewitnesses who saw and experienced these things. So there's this faith aspect of it, but there's also this, like, this. these are not just outlandish claims out of nowhere. There are people who saw these things happen, and they collected them together uh, in, into one story at the same time, which I think is it, very helpful for me to, to process and know. Now, what do you make of this? It, why wouldn't Jesus you know, just be born in a more sophisticated era? Because if he was born nowadays, like, everybody's got a camera phone, like we could video him, we could see him more clearly. And like, you know, for the unbeliever, wouldn't it make it, or even for us as believers, wouldn't it make it a lot easier for us to believe in him? Because, hey, we could like see him with our eyes or we could touch him or we could, you know, like there would just be so much more proof than, than we have, you know? And so what do you guys make of that tension? Well, I so I think it's funny that we assume that we're more sophisticated because our technology is better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had that. I'm not sure I would go there. Uh, secondly is I really do think that uh, our, our technology makes communication more efficient. I wouldn't say more effective. There's lots of information that we see uh, that comes through various forms of technology, and we don't agree with it or we don't believe it. And sometimes we might even say AI made it up. And so uh, the scripture does say, there's a really interesting verse, it says, in the fullness of time, Christ came. There was something unique about that time in history. And I think it has to do with not only a turning point for human history as God designed it, but also some of the realities of human history. So the, the religious world, uh, they would take advantage of people and they looked down on people. There was a way the, the religious universe had been turned upside down from what God intended. And the political world was very violent and, and thrived with inequity. And so there are these factors built in, and Jesus comes to show us something very different than the way the world does things. So it is true, a lot less uh, efficient, but I think when he came, it was way more effective. I, yeah, I also think that, you know, it is a very bold statement to say that, well, you know, if he came today and right now, I would believe. I, just because they didn't believe, right. I would believe. And again, do we really think that we're all that much better than, than everybody else? And, you know, people say all the time, well, if he just came, I would believe. If he just showed himself in some way. Uh, and my response to that is he did. Like, he did show up and he, he raised the dead. He rose from the dead himself. He healed the sick. He cured the blind. God showed up in human flesh. The whole Bible is is a, is a story of God attempting to make himself known to all of creation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not like God's lack of trying. It, we have stories and stories written about this. 
And I, I again, I'd go back to what Pastor said, like, am I really going to be as arrogant to believe that if he showed up today that I would believe him now? The fact is that he did show up uh, to humanity and we put him on a cross and we killed him. I think we'd probably be a very similar boat if, he, if it happened today too. And with all the you know crazy stuff that you see on the internet and everything, why would we why would we believe that this is actually something true when there's so much junk you know out there now that you have no idea if it's true or not? Uh, so I think we got to be very careful when we ask that question, um, and because I, I don't think the answer is what we'd want it to be. I agree. I also think that ultimately the thing that God is looking for from each of us is faith. Yes. And and we can't discount that or take that all away. So no matter what proofs we're given, and Jesus gave us a lot of proofs, mm. and even even you think about the resurrection, like he proved himself not just by appearing to his closest friends, he appeared to hundreds of other witnesses as well. Like what whatever the the hang up is, whether it's the virgin birth or any other miracle, at the end of the day, he gave us a lot to show us that he's real, but ultimately what he's looking for is for faith in our heart. And no matter what you believe, you have to place your faith in something. And Jesus invites us to put our faith fully in him. Yeah, definitely. Okay, now there is a leader at the time that Jesus is born. He liked to call himself Herod the Great. Uh, not much different than you, Stephen, that, that you always <laughs> ask me to call you Stephen the Great. That's true. It hasn't that quite true. stuck yet. No, but it has keep, not. Keep working it. Don't give up, you know. <laughs> yeah. So Herod the Great, you know, he wanted to have Jesus killed um, because he, he hears of the Magi coming. So let me ask you this. Why do you think that God chose to come to earth as a baby and like, why wouldn't he come in a different sort of way? Stephen, I'll start with you. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And it is one of the wonders and um, just mysteries of, the, of our faith, I think, too. Like, it doesn't make logical sense that he would choose to do that. If I were God, I would just come down quickly, get my work done, you know, wipe my hands off <laughs> and, and then go about my business again. But he chose to live a life with human beings. Uh, Hebrews tells us that we don't have a high priest, the high priest being Jesus, uh, who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. Mm -hmm. That there's something about who God is that he wanted to sympathize with the weakness of humanity, Mm -hmm. that he wanted to identify as a human being. And the best way to do that was to come as a baby and to live his life, to grow up in the ancient world, like the ancient world, the most uncomfortable place imaginable, that he wanted to do that so that he could identify with human beings, so he could take on the sins, the struggles of human beings. Um, and I, again, I don't understand it. I, I don't know if I would have done that I, if I were God, but it is the beautiful aspect of who God is, that he chose to do that for you and I, for humanity, and he didn't have to. Um, and I take a ton of comfort in, in that idea. Yeah, uh, I think those are great thoughts. Oh. I'm, I think it's really interesting that we assume that the best way for God to do things is like the superheroes in, in the movies that we watch. Mm-hmm. Just come down, bold declarations, and, and pound everything that, that doesn't look like it's supposed to. Uh, I don't think that's what, uh, how God thinks. In fact, uh, the, the technological or theological phrase for God coming to us is the God incarnate, right? God in the flesh. And God in, incarnate is to reveal who God is, not conceal. He did not come God incognito. Mm-hmm. He came, there's something about his birth as a baby and growing up among us that reveals something to us about him. And we should pay attention to that. And then the the natural tendency of human beings, I think, is to only look for the loud voices, the strong people, the well-resourced people, the people who we perceive as the movers and shakers as, and can make a difference. And what God shows us, the biggest difference that was ever made in our world started with the cry of a baby in a town in Bethlehem in a seeding trough in a manger. I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable how to think about this. So yeah, this is an incredible story. And what God did is is not come in to kick in doors and take names. He came in to change the world. And it turns out that requires a different strategy. John 1 talks about how the, the purpose of Jesus is that, that he would dwell with us, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, mm-hmm. uh, that God's entire purpose is that heaven and earth would come into relationship again. 
and it's really funny that that word that's used where it says that that Jesus dwelled among us the word in Greek is the same words that's used for tabernacle mm-hmm. the tabernacle was a place where God's presence would rest so he, quite literally he's saying you know that that the word became flesh and he tabernacled among us mm. uh, that this was a way that God's presence would be with humanity again and the way in which that Jesus that God's presence is with humanity is through the birth of a baby mm. and that he not just is with us in close proximity but he is with us in relation and he is with us in connection and relationship uh, with us so powerful this, the, the same God who is in the presence of the temple that sat, that they would make t- uh, sacrifices and worship to, that that same presence is now with humanity, that it's dwelling with us in the flesh. We have access to that presence. Mm. That's powerful, powerful, powerful. stuff. Yes. So uh, our next question comes in from one of our Instagram followers. Uh, her name is Hannah. Shout, Shout out. Shout out, Hannah. <laughs> and uh, I think it's a great question. And I'd love, uh, Pastor, let's get your take on this one. What is the significance of the wise men? And why do you think that they're included in this Christmas story? Good question. First of all, like the tradition says there were three of them. And the Christmas carol says there were three of them. Mm-hmm. Scripture doesn't tell us how many there were. <laughs> we just know there was at least two. And... Uh, so we don't know how many. Um, I, a lot of Bible scholars actually believe that these are the descendants of the magicians and wise men that uh, Daniel worked with in the nations of uh, Babylon and Persia. And in fact, they were known as kingmakers. Uh, they participated in the education of royals. And when they thought that the person had mastered all of the fields of study required, including sciences and including uh, their spiritual life, then they would place the crown on the head. In a way, wow. God is acknowledging that they're kingmakers in a way. And that's what upset Herod so much mm-hmm. when they come in. You know, he, uh, he was greatly distressed over this because they're kingmakers. When you're the king and somebody else is, is walking in as a kingmaker, that's, that's not so great. And then the other thing is they're the outsiders. Uh, they're, not, they're not Jewish. And God seems to be including in the very beginning of the story of Jesus that everyone is welcome, everyone's included, that outsiders who don't know anything or not much about Scripture um, and who are not part of the tribe that God has raised up, that yet they are included. Mm -hmm. Now, Stephen, I wanted to let you know, in lieu of a Christmas bonus this year, we got you a Santa Claus cookie. You're so generous. Thank you. Ironically, that is great. That is beautiful. It's a great cookie. What's crazy is you even picked it up (laughs) for yourself. So Merry Christmas to you. Um, I'm gonna, you, can I try it now? You can. I'm, go I'm, right I, ahead. I feel bad like ruining that frosting. You're gonna eat though. Santa's Let's go. Right. <laughs> great. Yeah. Great. You know, I'm not a frosting guy myself, but this is like this is a very good frosting. It's not too heavy. Mm. It's not good. Mm. So I think I'm gonna continue to critique this. <laughs> great. This Absolutely. Good. Well, while you are doing that, <laughs> I uh, I just want to say uh, this is that or ask this next question because. Most people believe that Jesus was at least a good person. He was a prophet. He was a good teacher. Like he's an important figure in human history. Like not a lot, not a lot of arguments around that. But where the hangups uh, have to do with are, was he actually a miracle worker? Um, And really, ultimately, the question comes down to, was Jesus really God? Mm -hmm. And I think you guys have touched on this question already, but I want to have you answer the question, why is the answer to that question so important? Stephen, I'll go to you first. Yeah, it's very, very important. I I think firstly, very briefly would be that if he's just a person, if he's just some random dude who did some really cool things, then I could ignore him and I didn't have to actually listen to him. But he claims to be so much more. If he's actually God, then I have to kind of listen to what he has to say. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important thing. The second thing is this. I'm going to backtrack here. This is going somewhere. Uh, But in, in, uh, in Genesis 15, there's a story where God is setting up a promise with Abraham and his family. And, and it's this covenant that he's making with them, that he's going to bless them. He's going to make their descendants as numerous as the stars, a really, really powerful thing. And, and God tells him, Hey, Abraham, if, if you break this covenant, there's going to be consequences for it. 
And they do this ancient ritual that was popular in the ancient culture where they would take a bunch of dead animal carcasses and they would split them in half. It's really weird and gruesome. But they would split them in half and make like an aisleway. And on both sides, there'd be dead animal carcasses. And you would have to, as the person at the receiving end of that covenant, you would have to walk through that aisle, through the dead bodies of the animals. And the sense of what you're communicating there is saying that if I break this covenant, if I break this promise, then let it be done to me the same thing that are, that's done to these animals. So let me be destroyed in the same way these animals have been destroyed. So in this story in Genesis 15, go read it if you haven't, uh, Abraham is about to walk through. He's about to go through the animal carcasses and, and make this promise to God. And right before he does, God stops him and puts him into a sleep. And in Abraham's vision, God himself is the one who walks through the animal carcasses. It's not Abraham. Mm -hmm. And what God is telling Abraham that if and when you break this covenant, when you mess up, I am going to be the one that takes this payment. I will take the consequences onto myself. And the reason why is because Abraham did not have the capacity to take that upon himself. He could not carry that load on his own. He could have tried. He couldn't have done it. Only God had the ability to take that consequence, to take that punishment, to uphold, to bring us back into a covenant in a relationship with him. Only God had the ability to bear that weight. So it is important that we believe that Jesus is not just some human being because another human being like you and I, even if they're a little bit better than us, don't have the ability to hold the weight that God can hold. Only God is able to do that. So it's very important that this Jesus guy is actually God and he's not just some really cool guy who said nice things or did some cool magic tricks, that he's actually God. That's great. I don't have anything to add for this. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Mic drop. There you go. <laughs> no, that was great. That was great. Now, I, I want to personalize this a little bit. What, what hope has been brought to you from the Christmas story? Like, like how has this impacted and affected your life? Yeah, well, um, uh, I was able for our 25th anniversary to go to Italy and uh, to Rome and see uh, a work of Michelangelo known as the Pieta. And it's the most beautiful piece of art I have ever seen in my life. And that's not just my opinion. Uh, since that thing has been created for hundreds of years, people have made some sort of pilgrimage to go to that place to see that piece of art. Like they, they recognize that there's something unique and very special about it. I think that when we look at the Christmas story, there's a reason that this story continues on, even though it's it's told in only 120 verses of Scripture. The entire nativity is told in 120 verses and only two Gospels. So we've, we've got a lot of information in, from a very short space. And and why does it resonate? Because there's something beautiful about it. It's real. It's It's not just a fanciful tale. It's not just a moral. There's something incredibly beautiful about it, that God has come to us. And it reminds us that he's not only with us, but that he is for us. And that's what that's the message that we get from the Christmas story. And so because uh, not all of my life is uh, in palaces and in beautiful places and, and eating the best of foods, uh, we're all required to walk through some dark spaces. We're all required to walk through some difficult times. And the Christmas story reminds us that even in a barn in Bethlehem, that there is, God is doing amazing work, mm -hmm. even out in the fields where the shepherds are keeping watch over sheep. God is doing amazing work, even from faraway places where no one knows the name of God. God is doing amazing work. The Christmas story just reminds us of that, and that's what gives me hope. Yeah, man. I think we, most people have this general assumption, and it's probably because of bad experience with other like religious circles and stuff like that, but we have this assumption that God's natural bent is to move away from me, yeah. that God doesn't want to be near me, that God despises me. And the only way that God would want to be near me is if I get better, if I do better, if I behave better. In the Christmas story, just shatters that idea uh, that, that God desires for humanity to be with him, uh, that, that, that he wants this closeness of relationship and proximity and he desires, and, and not just the elite, not just the best of the best, but the shepherds mm -hmm. and the, those who were the, the Gentiles, who were not part of the Jewish family, those from far away, those who were poor or oppressed, and, and those who were wealthy mm -hmm. and uh, had it all. 
that, that God's desire is to be with humanity. And when I think for myself personally, that there are many times in my life where I feel like I have disappointed God, mm-hmm. where I've not lived up to God's standard, where I feel like I, I'm not good enough to be loved by God. The Christmas story tells me that God desires to be with us. In fact, his name, the angel tells Mary and Joseph to name him Emmanuel. That means that God is with us. That's mm-hmm. not. It's not just a promise of proximity. It's not just his physical. It is God is with us. He is for us. Mm -hmm. We are with the person in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And when I remember that of the Christmas story, that brings me so much hope for me and my family, for my church, that God's not running from me. He's Mm -hmm. not running from us, that he's he's actually moving towards us. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, man, that's encouraging. It really is. And that's what I want to leave you with today. If you are going through some darkness, know that God is a God who comes in and invades with his light for you. He loves you. He has not forgotten you. And even in this Christmas season, if it feels heavy to you, know that Jesus is with you. He loves you. He has plans and purposes for you. He has not forgotten you and he is always with you. That is the hope of Emmanuel. And so uh, we hope you have enjoyed this Christmas episode and that you have a blessed Christmas season. Thank you so much for joining us.